Well, hello friends, this is Ricky Watt, pastor of Havenwoods Baptist Church, and I want to welcome you to this time of Bible study today. I hope you're having a great day, and I want you to take your Bibles, if you have them with you, and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Several weeks ago, we began a series through the book of 1 Thessalonians. And one of the major themes of First Thessalonians is to be ready, to be ready for the return of Jesus, but also for us as Christians to be ready to love and serve and minister the way that God really wants us to. Now, remember, this letter that we know as First Thessalonians was a letter to a church. And so God is wanting to communicate some essential things to them. And today we're going to look at the last portion of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to close out the book today. And he talks here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 about the family. But not just the human family or our physical family but the spiritual family. I don't know about you, but years ago, when I was a little kid, I remember coming into the house and watching a show on TV that was different than anything I had ever seen before on TV. The name of the show was All in the Family. And the reason that it was so different was because uh, I had grown up watching Father Knows Best and uh, Leave It to Beaver, plays, shows like that that sort of gave you this idea of, you know, just uh, family bliss, that everybody loved everybody and there were never any arguments or any uh, fights or anything like that. And then here comes along All in the Family. And I think one of the reasons that that show was so popular was because so many people could relate to the dysfunction of that family, that they had some crazy beliefs and opinions and ideas, but they were a family. And I think that for us as Christians, sometimes we can get dysfunctional. Sometimes we can have opinions and ideas that really don't serve God. They serve our own desires. And so today I want us to look here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 at this message that I've entitled, All in the Family. And there's four statements that I believe God wants us to look at today into fixing our perspective on some of the things related to our spiritual family. The first thing I want you to see today is how to act toward the leaders of a church. You, you may be watching this and you've been a member of a church through the years. And I think one of the things that we have really missed out on is not teaching and training our people the value of leadership in the church and and how important that is for us to be able to to lead and serve and minister and, and there's two things here in first Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 12 through 13 that the Bible speaks of related to leadership in the church Let's just read it together. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 through 13. It says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you and the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Now, there's two things there that Paul addresses about the leadership in the church. The first thing that he says there in verse 12 is he says to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord 
and who admonish you. Now, that could be your pastor. That could be your church staff. That could be your deacons. That could be Sunday school teachers. That could be team leaders uh, on the, the different committees and teams in your church. But he says, you need to acknowledge those who lead and those who serve. And I'm just going to tell you as a pastor for a long time, the best thing you can do for your pastor and for his family and for your deacons and their families and all the other leaders in the church and their families is pray for them. Friend, you never know the battle that the people who have surrendered to the call to serve the church go through. It can be tough. It can be really hard. And it's not only hard for that individual, but it's hard for that family. That, that you know, the enemy looks at leadership in the church as, hey, if I can take them down, I can really do damage to the kingdom of God. I can really do damage to that church and to that community there. So we need to be thankful for the leadership of the church. We need to pray for the leadership of the church. And we need to support the leadership of the church. He says there that the call to, to serve in a church is, is a call to uh, care for those who are under our ministry. And he says, and to admonish them. That word admonish means to encourage, to build up, to, to get the people in the church and get the church itself to be all it can be in the Lord. But he also says in verse 13, he says, hold them in the highest regard and in love because of their work. He, he says to honor those who serve. And I remember as a, a young boy looking at our pastor and the people who served in our church with, with just honor and respect and love because they were called to come and serve the Lord and to serve us and equip us and encourage us in the Lord. And then he closes out that, uh, that verse, verse 13, he says, as a result of those things, to honor those who serve, to love those who serve, to pray for those who serve. He says, live in peace with each other. That we would just be committed to living in peace, to living in unity. And can I tell you, when a church has peace and unity, it has a strong witness in a community. If it is a church that is, is struggling and fighting and fussing all the time, it's going to be hard to reach those people for Christ and bring them into your church because your church has that reputation. And God says, I want you to have the reputation that you live at peace with one another. So, we need to, to think about how we act toward the leaders of our church. And, and can I just say this to you? I've known people through the years that are leaders in church that'll beat their chest and say, hey, you, you respect me. Well, friend, understand this. Respect is something that is earned. It is not something that's demanded. It's not something that just comes with a title. To, to me, that's the beauty of going to a church and staying and serving for a long time. Just recently here at Havenwoods, we've had baby dedications, several. And uh, one of the great blessings to me is how many of those who uh, came and dedicated their children to the Lord have been saved since I've been here at Havenwoods. Uh, who I counseled with and did their weddings. And now they have children and they are desiring for God to bless their family and use their family 
for the glory of God. And listen, when you go to a church and you just stay a year or two, you miss a lot of that. And so, so it's a commitment that you make that, that, hey, I'm going to come and I'm going to come and stay and give my life away in God honor and service to the Lord in the church. The second thing I want you to see is how to live with other believers. Now, again, I go back to that family illustration. But if you've got brothers and sisters, you know you don't always get along. There's going to be days that you're going to fight like cats and dogs. There's going to be days that, you, that, that you're not going to, to like one another a whole lot. And that same thing can carry over into our spiritual families, into our church families. That we may not always agree on everything. We may have different opinions and ideas about things. But here we see that in 1 Thessalonians 5, and we're going to read verses 14 and 15, that God speaks about our relationship to one another as brothers and sisters. He says this, he says, and we urge you brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage this, the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Now, there are three groups of people that Paul mentions here. The first group of people that he mentions, he says that we are to warn the idlers. Warn the idlers. I don't know how many of you ever um, have grown up like I did out on the river and going to the river and getting in the boat and all, but you may remember if you uh, have done that, that you go out there and especially if you're going to fish, you get out there in the boat, you get on the river and you cut your main motor off. And then you get up to what we always have was at the front of the boat, there would be a a trolling motor up there. And that trolling motor would help you ease into an area that, that would be a lot quieter than when you had that big mower, motor on the back going. But the fact was that that trolling motor wasn't really made to get you a far distance in a short amount of time. It just sort of helped you idle through the water. You may have been making just really slow progress. And I believe that's what Paul is referring to here. He's saying that we need to warn those who are just sort of treading water in their walk with God. He, he says they're not only are they idlers, but he says they're disruptive. It may be that there are people that, who like to stir the water. You know who I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Those people who love drama. Those people who love to, to stir the pot. They, they like to push the buttons. And what I've always found is those are the ones that when you go to them to say something to them, they're like, who, me? Not, I'd never do that, you know? And, and God says they're idlers. They're, they're disruptive in your life, in your family. And yes, even in our churches. That, you know, you can have 99 people agree on one thing and there'll be that one, you know, who's just going to be against it, no matter what, just for the sake of being against it. Well, God says we need to warn them. We need to warn them that they are being hurtful to themselves and they're being hurtful to the body of Christ. And again, it takes nerve, it takes courage to confront those people and say, hey, you need to be careful. 
because you are just idling by. You're just treading water. You've been, become complacent, apathetic in your relationship with God. And again, I've said this so many times, but friend, when you are apathetic and complacent in your walk with God, it doesn't just affect you. It affects others. And that's very dangerous. So we need to make sure that we warn the idlers. The second group of people that he mentions here is encourage the faint-hearted. Man, I'm telling you, through the years, I've seen so many dear brothers and sisters in the Lord who, for whatever reason, got their eyes off Jesus and they became faint-hearted. I mean, these are people who were Sunday school teachers, who, who worked with the kids' choirs, who, who worked with uh, the teenagers, who sang in the choir on Sunday, who worked with the students. You fill in the blank. They did all kinds of things in the church. And over time, they did as the Bible uh, refers to, they grew weary and they're well doing. And friend, a major way that we become faint hearted is when we begin to neglect our time with God. We don't read the Bible like we should. We don't pray like we should. Now we're still going through the motions of doing everything spiritual. We're at church and, and we serve and we do things. But can I tell you, there is nothing more discouraging than trying to serve out of an empty well. Uh, you know what I mean. That, that, that you're trying to serve others and you're just drying up spiritually yourself. And can I tell you, friend, your pastor can't fix that in you. Your church staff can't fix that in you. Your mom and daddy can't fix that in you. Only God can fix that. And you've got to come back to the Lord and say, God, I have, I have drifted from you. I'm not where I need to be in my walk with you. Lord, please forgive me. and Set me right again. And God will begin to encourage your heart. And then that leads to the third group that he mentions here. He says that we should be helping the weak ones. Helping the weak ones. I, I think that refers to new believers. You know, the ones that are young in their faith. I'm telling you, friend, there are two primary purposes of the church. One is to win the lost, and two is to make disciples. And I'm telling you, as the pastor here at Haven Woods, I'm constantly evaluating, God, what can we do to reach more people and develop the ones that you have sent to us. And again, it's real easy to get off on a lot of other things. And I'm not saying the church shouldn't do other things. But those are the two primary things that God tells us. We need to win the lost and we need to disciple the saved. I would ask you if you're a member here at Havenwoods to think with me to pray with me how can we do a better job reaching the lost how can we do a better job discipling people helping them grow in their faith maybe you go to another church and I would encourage you to pray for your pastor pray for your church staff pray for your people at your church and say God help us be soul winners Help us reach the lost. Help us disciple those who know Jesus. So that whole second point there is about how we live in fellowship with one another. Again, in peace, in unity. But, but we minister, we love, we serve, we encourage one another. Then the third thing that Paul addresses here is how to live toward God and respond to the situations where he puts you. So now we're getting more personal. How do I live uh, towards the Lord? And how do I respond to him 
in the situations that he puts me in. You may be watching this right now and you say, well, I tell you what, there's some, God's put me in some doozies. You know, God's allowed me to, to deal with a lot of tough stuff. God's allowed me to be in situations that I would never choose for myself. But friend, God chose that for you. Again, remember, uh, the Bible says that God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. There's three things that God tells us as we deal with our circumstances and situations that ought to be common in every Christian's heart and life. Keep reading with me. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 16 through 18. And this is what the Bible says there. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, that's one sentence. So I believe that what the Bible's saying here is that these three things or absolutely God's will for your life. Again, you say, God, what's your will for me? Well, here's three that he says, this is my will for you. The first thing that he says is to be joyful. He says, rejoice always. And listen, friends, there's going to be a lot of days that you're not going to feel like being joyful. But again, that's where the the line of, of uh, difference comes into, am I happy or am I joyful? See, happiness usually is determined by our circumstances. We're happy if everything's going our way. We're happy if it's a good day. But joy comes from God. It doesn't come from our circumstances. And joy gives us strength. The Bible says, I think over in the book of Nehemiah, it says the joy of the Lord will be your strength. So if the strength of our life is joy, can I just ask you, why are we so weak? Could it be because we haven't chosen to be joyful? The second thing he says is not only to rejoice always, but secondly, he says, pray Continually. Pray continually. Again, when it's easy, pray. When it's hard, pray. When you're having your best day, pray. When you're having your worst day, pray. That it is a, a, a mark of maturity in our life when we choose to say, God, I'm going to pray when it's easy and I'm going to pray when it's hard. Because we understand that prayer is our vehicle to communicate with God. We talk to Him. We listen to Him. It's a communication. It's a conversation, if you will, that we have with God. And it says a whole lot about where we are with the Lord when we choose to be joyful. When we choose to pray. And then number three, He says, be thankful now it, you notice it doesn't say be thankful in everything uh, for everything but it says be thankful in all things give thanks in all circumstances it's really hard to be thankful for some of the things we go through but in spite of what we're going through we can still be thankful to God you know, something I share with people all the time when I'm doing a funeral service. Something that God taught me after my daddy passed away. Is you can be uh, bitter over your loss. Or you can choose to be thankful for your blessings. You know, I, I, I was struggling. God, why why did you allow my dad to have his accident? And why did he die? And, 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 you know, why couldn't it have been somebody else? 
But then in, a, in just my time alone with God, it's like God spoke to my heart and said, Ricky, of all the people in the world that I could have chosen to be your daddy, I picked John Watt. And as I thought about that, God just drove me to thanksgiving, to gratitude, to say, God, instead of me being bitter over my loss, God, help me be thankful for my blessing. And again, friend, it may take us a little while to get to that point, but God wants us to get to that point that we can be thankful in every circumstance. Not for it, but in it. And then the fourth and final thing that Paul addresses here is how to react to God's guidance in our lives. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 through 22, he says this, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. As we think about how we react to God's guidance in our lives, the first thing that he says there is do not ignore the Spirit's prompting. You know how when, when God just speaks to your heart, you may be in a restaurant and God impresses on your heart, you need to share Jesus with that waitress. You, you may be, uh, you know, out in the community and God impresses something on your heart and you know that it's the Holy Spirit telling you what you need to do. And, and friend, we need to, to be active when the Spirit prompts us. But here's what I found. If you begin to ignore the prompting of the Spirit, his voice is going to get softer and softer in your heart and life. His voice will become faint. But if we listen and act on the promptings of God, it'll be so clear, it'll be so obvious when the Holy Spirit is prompting us to do something. So we need to, we need to, to be active we need to be listening to the prompting of the Spirit. But the second thing I want you to see is that we do not despise the Scripture's wisdom. Sometimes God speaks to us by His Spirit. Sometimes God speaks to us through His Word. And friend, we need to, to be sensitive to what His Word is telling us. He says there, He says, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. And you know how we know what is good and what is evil? By this word right here. That we allow the word of God to speak to us and direct us and guide us. Listen, friend, we need to be careful not to ignore the Spirit's prompting, but also not to despise the Scripture's wisdom. I read recently about a, a man who had gotten a new dog, and he was going to use the dog for uh, tracking bears. And he um, got this dog, and he... The dog was supposed to have been well trained and ready to go. So he takes the dog out to the woods. And sure enough, he had just let him out, let him out of his uh, cage. And as he let him out, this dog gets right on the track of a bear. And boy, he, he takes off and he's barking. And the dog gets a little ways down the trail. And then he takes off and turns another way. And, and he gets off down that way another, a little ways. And... He hear, the uh, uh, hunter hears the dog and he comes up to where the dog is and realize the dog's got a squirrel up the tree. Well, the dog's supposed to be chasing after the bear. Well, so he gets the dog away from the tree where the squirrel is and 
he uh, gets him on the trail again. He goes off. He starts chasing after the bear. He gets down there and catches up to where the dog is. And the dog's got his nose down in a hole where a little field mouse is. See, the, the, the dog was supposed to be tracking the bear, but he kept getting distracted off into other things. And friend, it's so easy for us to do that as Christians. I never will forget years ago, Dr. Jimmy Jackson, he was the pastor of Whitesburg Baptist Church in Huntsville, Alabama. He came to our church up at Thomasville Baptist when I was a teenager. And he made this statement, and it's always stuck with me. He said, we need to keep the main thing the main thing. So what that means to me, friend, is we need to keep Jesus as the priority of our lives. I have on my wall in my office a, a painting that says, love God, love people. Have passion for God. Have compassion for people. Friend, I pray that we would love the family. We would love the spiritual family that he has placed us in. I'm telling you, I love Haven Woods Baptist Church. I'm so thankful to be a part of this church family. And I'm telling you, God wants to do incredible things in us and through us. But sometimes we need to get out of God's way and let him do his work. So I want to pray for you today as we close our time together. God, I just pray right now that, Lord, you'd give us heart for you. God, that we would seek you in our hearts and lives. God, that we would not be complacent and apathetic about our walk with you. God, instead, we would have a passion for you. A passion that carries over into compassion for our brothers and sisters in Christ. God, I pray for our church here at Haven Woods and for each one's church that's watching this right now, that God, you would give us a spirit of peace and unity. So again, that we would be a wonderful testimony to our communities that we, that we live in, that you've placed us in, of the love and mercy and grace of Jesus. God, I pray today, if there's anybody watching right now who doesn't know Jesus, that God, they would call on you before it's too late, that they would acknowledge that you love them, you have an incredible plan for their lives. But we're each separated from God by our sin, our disobedience to God. But Lord, we thank you that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross. And that if we would call on Jesus and ask him to forgive us of our sin and to come into our heart and life and save us, that today we can be saved. We can know Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. But God, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are watching right now who know Jesus. God, I pray we would help you would help us love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And God, please help us to love one another like you love us, unconditionally, sacrificially to love one another. And that God, as we do that, you would send revival to our churches. That God, we could give you thanks and praise for who you are and for what you've done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, you know, you may have just prayed that prayer with me. You may have just given your heart and life to Jesus. If you didn't, I just want to tell you, you can call on Jesus anywhere at any time you just need to confess your sin to him and ask him to come into your heart and life and friend you can be saved uh, maybe today god's convicted your heart about the fact that you're saved but 
You haven't really been loving God like you should. And you haven't really been loving your brothers and sisters in Christ like you should. Well, God wants us to respond to his word. So if today you made a decision, if you made a commitment to God as you've watched this video, I want to ask you to respond. And the way you can respond is by sending me an email to rickywhite at gmail.com. That's all lowercase. Just let me know, Brother Ricky, today I prayed and gave my life to Christ. Brother Ricky, I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray for my church. I need, to, need you to pray that I would be more loving towards God and more loving towards my brothers and sisters in Christ. But allow God to work in you and work through you. And, and I pray that God will send revival to our churches so we can bring glory to God in the communities that he has placed us in. So I want to thank you for watching today. As always, I pray that God would bless you and use you in an incredible way. And we look forward to seeing you again real soon. God bless you and have a great day.